pioneer in this area. He has been involved with uh, the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and uh, uh, he was founding president of the International Education, uh, Educational Data Mining Society, and was one of the first and also current associate editors of the Journal of uh, Educational Data Mining. He developed uh, automated detectors that make inferences in real time about a student's affect and uh, motivational and metacognitive behaviors, including the first automated detector for of student disengagement, and work to link these constructs to long-term student achievement. These automated detectors have been embedded into several online learning systems used at scale in the United States. Uh, Dr. Baker's research uh, to develop automated detectors of engagement also led to the development of Baker Rodrigo Ocampa uh, Monitoring Protocol, BROMP, which is a protocol for classroom observation that has been used to study student engagement in a range of settings, including research on traditional classroom practices and informal field education. Dr. Baker has extensive collaborations, uh, and we are expecting that <laughs> after this we can continue our collaboration uh, here. But he has co-authored peer-reviewed scientific papers with more than 300 other scientists. And uh, let me uh, introduce also Dr. Uh, George Siemens. Uh, he uh, is a writer, theorist, speaker, and researcher uh, on learning, networks, technology, analytics, and vi visualization, openness, and organizational effectiveness in digital environments. He is the originator of connectivism theory, uh, which has been applied in uh, various parts of the world. Means I have personally uh, experienced that when I met, and George and I have worked together at Athabasca University before I joined at UNT. So I know him uh, also as a colleague. And I have been in different parts of the world, and they ask not about me. Oh, George works with you. <laughs> Can we actually have video conference that you are here? So I have uh, arranged actually a couple of them <laughs> with George at some point from China. Um, George joined the faculty and staff of the University of Texas at Arlington in December 2013 as the executive director of the Learning Innovation and Network Knowledge Research Lab, or LINK, LINK Lab, which opened in spring of 2014. Uh, he was also at uh, uh, Athabasca University in the Center of Distance Education and also a researcher and strategist with the Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute, TACRI, at uh, the Athabasca University. Uh, he is also credited with uh, running the first MOOC with Stephen Downs and uh, one more person was there. Dave Cormier, yeah, okay. So, uh, so he has been credited with running first MOOC in the world, uh, and that's how the MOOCs then started. So, so okay, we will hear, uh, we will have a panel with uh, both uh, uh, Ryan and uh, George afterwards, but uh, at this moment, uh, Ryan. Thank you for your kind words. Um, I really appreciate the warm welcome, and it's a great honor to be here visiting and speaking to all of you. Um, Great honor to be speaking with, you know, George in the audience. You know, um, when I'm giving a talk and I'm the one up here and George is not, I, I say, how did this happen? Because frankly, <coughs> George is a major international celebrity. Um, I, I could tell stories about it, but I won't at the moment. <laughs> I was once, you know, telling some, I was once telling somebody that George knows everybody. And as evidence, uh, we went, you know, this is a few years ago, and we went to the White House, and um, there on the platform was the Secretary General of the UN, uh, the President of the United States, uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, and George. And a person sitting next to me says, who are all those people up there with George? <laughs> so, um, he's quite the famous fellow. I'm assuming that you uh, invited me to speak here today because I'm actually a UNT alumnus. I. I had the great honor of studying, uh, studying at UNT for a couple years in the mid-90s. And it's wonderful to be back and kind of mind-boggling. Hey, good to see you. I didn't see you earlier. Um, it's mind-boggling uh, to see how much the campus has changed. I was walking around and I was like, am I on the right campus? I don't recognize anything. It's just truly amazing. So thank you so much for having me here today. The talk I'm going to present today is towards massive replication of scientific findings in massive online open courses, work that clearly couldn't have occurred without George to have invented them in the first place. This is work in collaboration with Miggy Andres at Penn, Chris Brooks at Michigan, um, Josh Gardner at Michigan, and Dragan Gasovich at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. <coughs> so 
MOOCs are an amazing opportunity to study learning at scale. There's millions of learners, thousands of courses, billions of interactions. Um, Anant Agarwal, the uh, chief scientist of edX, said it's a particle accelerator for learning research. And yet, despite this amazing opportunity, a lot of the research has a certain sameness to it. You know, what predicts completion? Well, there's been a lot of work on this question over the last even just three years. For example, doing well in assignments predicts completion by everybody at all. Watching videos predicts completion by everybody and their brother. And you get a lot of, first author says, in my course, posting the form is associated with completing the course. And then author B says, well, in my course, posting a form more is not associated with completing the course. Therefore, author A is wrong. And then the third author will come in and say, well, in my course, posting the form more is, in fact, associated with completing the course. Therefore, author A is vindicated, and author B is completely a complete bozo. <laughs> we can do better than this as scientists. Now, one possible way to do better than this is meta-analysis. Who here has heard of meta-analysis? Okay, quite a few hands. It's a well-known set of methods for integrating across published scientific results. And you use it to determine whether a claim is true across evidence from many different studies. So maybe six studies say yes, and four studies say no, and seven, it's, not, it's kind of in the middle somewhere. And you can integrate across all of them and come up with an answer of how many say yes and how broad the effect is overall. But we can do better than that, too, because meta-analysis has some key limitations. First of all, meta-analysis depends on synthesizing across published research. Maybe we don't need to wait for the findings to be published. Meta-analyses by nature are focused on fairly general and high-level questions. You get 123 people who have different educational games that they study. Those games have different features. At the end of it, all you can really answer with a meta-analysis is, are games good? You know, is computer-assisted instruction good? So maybe we can focus on finer-grained questions. And for any given data set, you're usually limited to what's already been analyzed. <clears throat> you can look at what they publish. If you want to ask a question about the data set that maybe half your authors didn't ask, you've either got to just drop that question, look at the subset that have it, or get in touch with those people and get them to give you their data. Which, if you've ever tried to get a researcher's data from five years ago, much less 20 years ago, you know it's non-trivial. Those of you who are not familiar with this should after my talk is over, YouTube data management snafu. It's got pandas. It's really fun. Don't watch it now. <laughs> In this talk, I'm going to discuss an engine that we're developing with the eventual goals of determining which findings hold across MOOCs. That's the kind of traditional meta-analysis question. But also determining which findings hold for which types of courses, and determining which findings hold for which types of students, and trying to do so quickly. So we don't have to wait until people publish all this stuff. We can just go straight to our questions and answer them at scale. In other words, the power of meta-analysis without having to depend on other people doing the analyses first. I also like to think of it as more rapidly scalable meta-analysis. We developed two architectures, both called MORPH, M-O-R-F, the MOOC replication framework, for doing this. The first is a framework for asking if-then questions about data. And the second is a framework for, te for testing complex prediction models. <clears throat> Today's talk is going to focus on the first of these, largely because the second one hasn't yet been uh, fully peer-reviewed. Uh, the first one has. Um, it's going to be appearing at the Learning Analytics Conference in Sydney, Australia in about two months. And also because it's my graduate student, Miggy Andres, who did this analysis, so I'm a little closer to it. The architecture of these if-then rules is a production rule engine built in Jess. If you're not familiar with what Jess is, don't worry about it. It's a common production rule system. By the way, I'm noticing I haven't gotten a question yet. Um, you're welcome to interrupt me at any time, just so you all know. Otherwise, I'll talk very quickly and we'll be done early. <laughs> so we take published findings or unpublished ones. We turn them into if-then statements. <coughs> so if a MOOC participant who is attribute does action, then outcome. So an example would be, if a student posts more frequently on the MOOC discussion forums than the average student, then they're more likely to complete the MOOC. And a rule is validated in our engine by comparing the number of cases where the rule is fulfilled to the counterfactual where the then clause of the rule is fulfilled, but not its if case. So, yes? You didn't mention I can interrupt. Yes, you can, and I welcome interruption.
<laughs> That's a great question. So what I would say, Kinshuk, is that this infrastructure, the first infrastructure, is designed for fairly simple rules. Um, just, you know, attributes. You can have more than one attribute, right? So that could be the kind of cases you're talking about. You could have more than one action. But it's fairly simple if-then rules. To get really complex models of interactions, uh, multi-level interactions, we would use the second framework which is for testing prediction models. So yeah, part of the idea was that the first of these two frameworks, the second of these two frameworks is more for computer scientists and folks who can build the complex models. The first of the two frameworks is more for educational psychologists and uh, researchers who have relatively more straightforward questions about the data. Not to uh, be disrespectful, by the way, to educational psychologists. Educational psychologists are capable of asking very complicated questions. Just kind of two different user bases for the, for the framework. We find that graduate students at Penn Graduate School of Education, for example, are much more likely to have just kind of relatively straightforward questions that might be of the nature of, if a learner does this, do they complete more? Or if a learner um, is from this specific group, are they more likely to watch more videos? Thank you for the question. And thank you for kicking off the questions. Again, I talk quickly because I get excited, so. And it's very exciting to be back where you uh, went to undergrad, <coughs> giving a talk. So for example, let's take the rule, if a student posts more frequently than the average student, they're more likely to complete the MOOC. We compare the two cases of posts more frequently and completes to the case where they don't post more frequently, but they still complete. Because if this one is kind of doing better than this one, where's the problem with this rule? <coughs> Our method, very straightforward and simple to start. Within each individual course, we're going to take the number of students who match each, and we're going to do a chi-square test. We're not doing anything fancy here. And then we're going to do a Benjaminian Hochberg post hoc correction for the fact that we're going to test multiple findings at once. I saw one smile and nod. How many folks in this room are familiar with Benjaminian Hochberg? Yeah, it looks like nobody except the one person who smiled and nodded. One person, two people. Who here is familiar with the Bonferroni correction? A few more. So the bone for correction is a classic way in statistics of saying, if you test 20 things, you're probably going to get one statistically significant result just by chance. Uh, the bone for correction tries to adjust for that by being more conservative and saying that in the context of all the tests I did, is it plausible that any one of them could come up significant? The bone for correction, however, has been thought since the early 90s to be massively over-conservative because it treats every test like, it's the, like you're cherry-picking just that test out of the whole set. Modern false discovery rate post hoc corrections um, control for how many are significant out of your set of tests. With the idea being that let's say that you, uh, you test 20 things and 19 of them are significant. The odds that that is going to happen just by sheer luck is very low, so we shouldn't treat it like that's the case. Um, there's a whole family of those post hoc corrections. Benjamin Hochberg is the easiest. You can do it in Excel in a couple minutes. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, uh, I'm happy to share resources with you. Sorry for going on a little tangent, but I just feel very enthusiastic about this because people are largely either not doing post hoc corrections and getting a lot of type 1 error, or they're using methods that are about, f about 25 years out of date and getting a lot of type 2 error. <coughs> so our first published proof of concept of this, Andres et al. in press, was conducted in a single instance of a single MOOC where we tested uh, 21 findings. The analysis I'm going to present today, which again is appearing in two months at Learning Analytics, is an analysis conducted on data from 29 iterations of 17 MOOCs. And these MOOCs were all conducted at the University of Edinburgh on the Coursera platform. So present status, by the way, of our infrastructure is we've completed um, data ingestion for 56 more MOOCs at Penn and 77 more MOOCs at Michigan on both Coursera and edX. So our current data set is somewhere in the scale of 1.5 million students. Um, but in this analysis, we're only going to be working with a miserly 514,000 students' data. Uh, help me out, actually, by the way, because I've been bragging on this, and I've got some people who might actually be able to tell me my brag is wrong. I believe that this is the largest data set ever in a scientific paper for fine-grained analysis of students. Am I wrong about that? Can anyone tell me a bigger one? It depends on which area you take. I know that Edinburgh University, for example, did a study of uh, uh, students uh, uh, in a forum, and that was a public uh, 
<laughs> okay. I'm familiar with larger data sets in public forums uh, beyond just that one. I mean, uh, so yes, that if you were to include that, that's why you, you, you narrow it down just enough and you can be the biggest. But fact of the matter is, I'm, I'm still excited. No, and, and, and this is in, in higher education. That makes a big difference. <coughs> well, thank you. You're being very charitable. <laughs> See, that's why I, I, I dared the room and the room responded. Nonetheless, I remember when I was a graduate student being excited to have data from 70 students in an hour of usage, so times have changed. 86 million transactions of the software. That's anything the student did in the learning platform. Courses on a variety of topics, artificial intelligence, animal behavior and welfare, astrobiology, um, veterinary and equine nutrition, um, general elections, um, intro to philosophy. So, Andy Warhol, a pretty big range of different course topics, which is good, by the way, because if we want to say that our findings are somewhat general, if you just have what, if we had, say, the same size, but it was all engineering courses, we'd really only be able to make any conclusions about engineering. Also, although I don't think I have a slide, Edinburgh MOOCs, like most MOOCs, get a global audience. So this is not just students from Scotland. I'm not actually sure there'd be, yeah, there'd be a lot of, large proportion of the Scottish population taking a MOOC if it was just them. Um, initial findings analyzed. So this is our first paper trying to do this at scale, so obviously we're not going to do the most exciting stuff we could ever do. We took 15 findings from five previously published papers that use MOOC data. And these consisted of low-hanging fruit findings that could be easily replicated. Very limited span of behavior, much more we can do in the near future. Miggy is actually working on a much richer analysis right now to try to submit to EDM in three weeks. Clearly just the beginning. <coughs> but here are the examples, and we pick these from published literature because we, we realize in analyzing such simple things, people might say, well, does, does anyone actually care about this? So somebody cared about this enough to write a paper, and other people cared enough about it to accept that paper at a respected venue. So Jen DeBoer at Purdue, for example, uh, at MIT at the time, said if participants spend more time in the forums than average, they're more likely to complete. Also more time in the assignments than average. Uh, Yang et al. at Carnegie Mellon looked at the length of posts and looked at long posts. They looked at more frequent posting, more frequent responding to posting. I'm at five here. Thread starting. Um, Ramesh et al., also Carnegie Mellon, looked at uh, how much people respond to your threads. The idea being that maybe people who have threads that people respond to, they're actually uh, creating, they're participating in a way that's more positive that is associated with people who are eventually going to complete. Um, pr people who have more respondents than average. Um, we also took some uh, analyses from Scott Crossley at Georgia State's work, analyzing the linguistic properties of MOOC forum participation, where Crossley found that if participants use more concrete words, they're more likely to complete. <coughs> if they use more bigrams and trigrams from the British National Corpus, which is a large corpus of uh, common phrases, um, well, it's actually like speeches from British politicians and other British sources, they use more bigrams and trigrams from that source, they're more likely to complete. They found that if the participant uses less meaningful words than average, you're more likely to complete. Meaningful words, I'm not a linguist, and so I'm leaving myself open to be criticized here. But my understanding from what Scott has told me is that meaningful words connect to more other words in um, a semantic database. So that means that equine is less meaningful than horse. So more specialized words, in other words. More sophisticated words, I've uh, this has to do with le reading lexile levels. It's not flesh Kincaid. It's the more modern uh, Cometric scale from McNamara. Um, and using a wider variety of words than average, more I could complete. <coughs> uh, we used cross. Yes, sir. Relative to the current course they're in. That's right. You could think about doing that. In practice, these metrics are very different between courses. You can imagine that, for example, a course on astrobiology has a lot less variance in the terminology used than a course on general elections or philosophy. Thank you for the question. Yeah, the same kind of question. Is there much variation uh, across iterations? Because your intro to philosophy, you had four iterations. Were there differences in those? And did you <coughs> 
The answer, we didn't actually look at that in this specific uh, analysis, but the answer is that second iterations of courses and subsequent ones tend to be more similar to each other than the first one. First iterations of courses tend to have a lot more students, they tend to have much higher drop rates, and they tend to have a lot more casual use, which changes all the metrics. So one reason why we, we didn't explicitly look at first iterations versus subsequent in this one, actually Gardner's paper that's under review right now actually does look at that issue. Great question, thank you. I saw another hand in the back. Yes, ma'am. And we would love to analyze all kinds of stuff. I'll talk later about how we're opening up our framework for other people to do analysis. We'd love to welcome your analysis. We were trying to stick with published ones that we also thought had some face validity for our framework to start. But in fact, people have, done look, have looked at day of the week. Um, there, was a, there was a video that is now unfortunately no longer on YouTube called The Dark Side of the Moodle, which found that the pattern of access of the Moodle course platform at one university in Britain had the same time signature as Pink Floyd's uh, uh, piece Time. It was, I think, 137. 137 every week. And it had to do with when assignments were due. So there are dynamics around that. And in particular, you see a lot heavier usage on the day, not really on, I don't know, Mondays, but the day that assignments are due, you tend to see big upticks of access. Thank you. It's a great question. These things, actually, by the way, I want to say one more thing. They sound trivial at the surface, Mondays. But in fact, these are part of the dynamics of how these things are used, and they are interesting, I think. Thank you. I welcome arbitrary questions. They're my favorites. By the way, I have no idea what time it is. Um, can somebody tell me? 25. 25 after? Oh, good. So I have plenty of time. Oh, brilliant. All I had to do was look. <laughs> so we used uh, Crossley and Kyle's tools, Tails and Taco, for our linguistic analyses. We integrated them into our framework. <coughs> In brief, I'll go into more detail in a minute, 12 of the 15 findings replicate after the post hoc correction, and t two of the remaining three replicate in the opposite direction. <coughs> so um, here I'm showing uh, the overall finding. So the, the Z and the P are kind of the overall across all the course instances. The plus and minus are how many course instances go in the same direction as the original paper. The minuses are how many go in the opposite direction. And then there's um, an odds ratio for uh, how big the difference is. So for example, if people spend more time on the forums, they're more likely to complete. 29 out of 29. That's kind of one of those things where you go, OK, I guess this really is a thing. It turns out, by the way, that this is a little more interesting than you might think. We'll talk about it a little later. But actually, more time on the forums um, actually, in some cases, does not correlate with other life outcomes. So it, complete, it correlates to completion, but it doesn't actually correlate all of the time with other life outcomes. Um, if you make longer posts, in general, more likely to complete. There's one exception. Um, if people respond to you more, generally more likely to complete. However, if you, start more th if you start threads more frequently than average, you're actually not more likely to complete 27 to 0. It's not quite because it's not quite because the first one is do you I guess it is because the first one is do you ever start a thread? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but that's right. In order to be more frequent, that's right. So in other words, there's a lot of people who start threads at least once or twice and do great. I mean, in fact, if you put these together, and I didn't actually do this analysis, you could say maybe starting smaller numbers of threads is actually a little better. That may be among other things because people who start really large numbers of threads are probably either struggling mightily with it or are engaging in lots of crap posting. Um, Comer, Baker, Comer, Wang, and Baker had a paper um, a couple years ago um, where we actually looked at students, for example, verbal abusive instructors on forums. And that's certainly not a positive behavior. <coughs> um, so other ones, so for example, using more concrete words, that was original finding from Crossley in a MOOC on data science, but you can see that that really kind of doesn't hold very well, right? 
It's plus in 3, it's minus in 5, it's a null in 21. There's really kind of no story there. Now what we want to look at going forward is what, what's different about those three than those five, and that's the kind of thing we can do. Um, using less meaningful words, more likely to complete. By the way, there's a story on that one that I forgot to mention, which is that in the original Crossley paper, it was actually using more meaningful words. In our first analysis um, doing this, we actually found that Crossley had gotten the result backwards. Um, because we, we went to Crossley with a less meaningful, more likely to complete, said, huh, isn't that weird that we got the opposite? This is our Andres et al. in press before this one with just one MOOC. And Crossley looked back and realized he'd gotten it wrong, so he actually made an announcement, because Scott's a good scientist. He made an announcement on his web page and on Twitter, hey, I was wrong. My finding actually went the opposite way. I've posted a correction on my web page. So that's one of the things that replication can do. People, even in the original work, sometimes you find there was a mistake. But we replicated the correction of Crossley's work 16 to 0 to 13. Um, Using a wider variety of words, more could complete, that was true in the original Crossley. And it was true in two of our courses, but it was not true in 13. <coughs> so in other words, students who are kind of rambling on lots of topics are not actually being more likely to complete. And again, this kind of can make face, face sense, but it wasn't kind of, you know, the published finding went the other way previously. I've already kind of gone through this. So future work on this, more findings. You know, we're gonna, we are actively looking at a wider range of analyses um, of things we can look at. More courses, so we now have all the Penn and Edinburgh courses. We kind of delayed on actually looking at what distinguishes which courses when it was just the Edinburgh data, because now that we have three universities of data, we have, and I think like more than like seven times the data, it just made more sense to wait on that. <coughs> which findings apply for which categories of learners and courses? So um, in fact, you know, can we figure out why using more concrete words seems to be good in some cases and bad in other cases? And I want to point out, by the way, that even though the overall finding was kind of non-significant and it was kind of mixed, in those individual three and five courses, it was a statistically significant finding, even after post hoc correction. Sir? I'm just wondering this. In many of these cases, it seems like your knowledge is almost as big as I would put it in a positive situation. Well, part of it is we're being very conservative on what's a plus versus a null, because we're doing that post hoc correction. Um, so a lot of these nulls might actually be pointing in the same direction, just not quite strongly enough to be significant. Um, individual courses, and this is one of the reasons why it's exciting to have a framework of this, individual courses may not have enough statistical power to look at this, whereas many do. But the second thing is that to the extent, it still may be that these are having a bigger effect than most of these or many of these. And that's another thing we can look at. What is it about the courses, beyond just taking the one at the top and saying pluses versus minuses, pluses versus nulls? What's going on differently? Why don't uh, less meaningful words matter as much? It might be, for example, that the, that the pattern of, of what words are meaningful corresponds differently to the course content. So for example, a course on equine nutrition might have a heavier use of rare words for legitimate uh, class purposes than a course on uh, general politics or intro to philosophy. You can imagine that a course on intro to philosophy is probably going to have a lot of everyday words being used in valid course discussions. So I think that's what's going on, but that's part of what we want to investigate. That's right, and exactly. Truth, justice, peace, love, those are probably not going to be in astrobiology. Well, maybe truth, but I guess unless you're part of the Union of Concerned Scientists, then you have a lot of concerns about those. Yes, ma'am. Well, part of why we start at the student level is because, A, because most of the, almost all the published research is at the student level. People haven't had the kind of data sets to look at the instructor differences, really. So that's part of what we hope to do now that we have the full, uh, full large framework, is to start to look at the pedagogical difference between courses and how that drives it. 
uh, those pedagogical differences can be in the design of courses. Some courses have shorter assignments, some have longer assignments. Some have shorter videos, some have longer videos. Some have talking heads, others have just text or animations. Um, but also the instructor's behavior on the forum. Uh, some instructors are on the forum every single day responding to students, and others just kind of leave it to sit and never come back to it. So those kind of differences may be part of what drives the, these differences. And we're only kind of going to be able to, this is stuff, stuff that we couldn't really even investigate until we had a data framework like this. Yes, Michael. Yeah, at the student level, though, are you going to look beyond <coughs> reading the course? Because you know, what learning is occurring in terms of other performance indicators? So that's a great question. That's a hard one. And the reason is because most MOOCs don't have actually any good learning metrics. It, to some extent, the performance and the completion are kind of very tied together because you completed most of these by doing well on the assignments. So it's some measure of success. In other work in my lab, we have looked at, uh, for example, whether people participate in the scientific community of practice after the course, submitting scientific papers in the field that they've learned about. Um, and we found that findings that look a little different than that, this. Um, uh, um, there's a group in Delft, I've just spaced on the name of the researcher, but they've looked at whether students learn skills in their computer programming courses that then translate to using different programming tactics in GitHub repositories. Um, MIT has done a few pretest, post-test kind of designs for their courses. The problem is that that doesn't scale very easily. For what we can scale, our outcomes are more limited to things like, did you complete? Did you watch a lot of the videos? Did you uh, engage in, for, for example, picking one week and watching those videos? Did you do well on at least one assignment? <coughs> things like that. We don't really have much carry forward. We do with our data set have the ability to do a little bit of, do they do well on the next course? Some, Preparation for future learning. We haven't yet done that one. Part of the thing is, you've noticed already in this discussion, there's so many things we could do with this data infrastructure. We don't have time to do it all, which is one reason why we're opening it up to people. Um, I'll talk about this later, but we invite warmly colleagues to come use our repository. That's one of the things we want to do here. <coughs> So Gardner et al. Uh, took a published paper on predictive models within a, MOOCs, uh, within a MOOC. So he was trying to actually predict early in the, so he took a paper by Shing et al. Um, who, that tried to say, can we predict from early in the course who will eventually p complete the course? Again, completion. By the way, one other reason we're starting on completion is because that's where all the papers are. So if we want to demonstrate replication, that's the place to start. But. Um, so in particular, uh, Xing looked at which types of features and algorithms perform better. Um, we then uh, tested the prediction modeling approaches across the full range of MOOCs and MORPH. We found that some of the findings replicated, but many don't. Um, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to send the results. Um, we have developed an open API and platform that enables testing of predictive modeling pipelines. So if you want to do a prediction model and see how it works across courses, you're welcome to do it literally today. We can get you, maybe not today, we might take you a couple weeks to get credentials because we have to sign a data use agreement and things like that, but you know. You could start the process today. <coughs> production rule analysis should be available within a couple months. If you want to test a production rule, if there's a production rule you're burning to, to learn about and you're willing to collaborate and you know collaborate on a paper or something, email me and we can get you going tomorrow because, because Miggy and Josh can already do it. We just don't have that open to public access. Literally, we opened our first alpha version for public access last week. So we're just getting there. Um, you can submit Docker containers containing analyses or submit analyses in Python. If that's gibberish to you, then you're probably going to want the production rule uh, infrastructure rather than the full prediction model one. Um, here's our web page. Um, if you can't find it later, email me or come talk to me later. So I wanted to kind of just go through some of the other MOOC research we've done, just to kind of show that we are not just focusing on completion. So we studied links between behaviors in MOOCs and long-term student participation in, sci in the scientific community of practice. Specifically for a MOOC on data science, we looked at whether people submitted scientific papers to relevant conferences to that MOOC in the following two years, or relevant journals. Um, we found, intriguingly enough to us, that there's been a lot of literature showing that posting on forums is associated with better outcomes. We replicated that here. It's been shown in uh, for credit courses. 
In general, if you want to look at completion or passing, it matters how much you post. Lurking is not a good thing in those contexts for those questions. However, it turned out that forum lurkers, people who read all the posts but didn't actually post themselves, were just as likely to submit a scientific paper as forum posters. And both were much more likely to submit than people who weren't on the forums. So that was a finding that, again, hard to do at scale because we had to know which journals and conferences were the relevant ones. And we had to have insider access to get what the submissions were. Um, you could do it with published articles, but that would be a smaller proportion of it. And also, um, you'd still probably need some hand processes because Google Scholar is most unfriendly to web scrapers. We tried to, we did an analysis, we, we fought with Google, we, we tried to web scrape and we fought with Google a while and gave up actually and just did it by hand. Another thing we've done, I mentioned, is studying student negativity in discussion forums. Some students, most students in MOOCs are very pleasant and positive participants, but there's a certain number who are hostile to the instructors. Um, I know that George and I, when we taught DAL MOOC, we had a bunch of students who one week were all complaining about a tool we were using in the course. Um, and uh, the first time I taught my MOOC, I was the recipient of quite a bit of unpleasant comments. Um, but not nothing compared to like Denise Comer or some other people who got harassment and threats even. Um, Unfortunately, when you have 40,000 people taking a course, you take any group of 40,000 people, how many of them are going to have some serious emotional problems, right? So we studied the student negativity and discussion forums um, in that and kind of looked at what some of the factors were associated with it. They included people who thought that they knew more than other students. And unfortunately, every, well, fortunately, unfortunately, but shamefully, every single person in the courses we studied who engaged in verbal abuse of the instructors had a male screen name. So. Um, grit and participation in MOOCs. So a lot of people have said MOOCs have a low completion rate, you know, and that's a problem. And then a lot of people responded, but many of those people never intended to complete in the first place. You shouldn't count them. <coughs> it turns out that, in fact, if you ask people at the beginning of the course, do you intend to complete, it's a pretty good predictor. But what's an even better predictor is whether they have grit, according to Angela Duckworth's grit survey, which asks how likely you are to persist in educational tasks. So it turns out that if you say you're going to complete, but you're not gritty, you're less likely to complete than if you say you're not going to complete. You don't want to, but you are gritty. That was work by L. Wong at Arizona State, a uh, former grad student from our group. Building adaptivity into MOOCs. We've actually been working in the MOOC I teach, Big Data in Education, to build in various uh, adaptive aspects using the Generalized Intelligent Framework for Tutoring from the US Army. Um, in specific, we have looked at building in assignments that have context-sensitive hints. They break down the problems into step-by-step -step chunks and uh, give feedback to students when they are getting it wrong. There's also, uh, we're building in kind of recall items that loop you back to the video if you're struggling. If students make specific mistakes in the assignment, they get looped back to the part of the video they might have missed. Uh, we're building in additional explanations on that kind of stuff and self-explanation activities. <coughs> There's actually like this amazing I guess since the 1970s, literature on intelligent tutoring systems, and going back to like the 50s, computer-aided instruction, that most MOOC developers have completely and utterly ignored. And we're actually trying to say, is this stuff relevant? Can we use it? Um, one more here is comparing behaviors associated with success in MOOCs to the behaviors associated with success in for-credit online learning. We had the opportunity to use a platform called um, Janix, which, excuse me, <laughs> Janix is the online learning platform for the state of Oklahoma. And uh, they have both for credit and MOOC courses of the exact same course. So it's identical in every way except the for credit or not, which is rare. Usually there's just different courses and it's apple and oranges. We were able to say what are the behaviors associated with success in the two contexts. Found out it was quite similar. Students, there's a lower baseline of completion in MOOCs. But students tend, the same behaviors tend to be meaningful and predictive of positive outcomes. Um, I guess I have a few minutes, so I will eat a little bit of time talking about some of our other research that you may or may not be interested in. Um, we've worked to model complex skill and inquiry skill during learning. So for example, in science simulations, we can see whether students' scientific uh, inquiry strategies correspond to sophisticated strategies or more trial and error strategies and then use that to actually drive intervention that gives students feedback on how to inquire more effectively that leads to systemic change in their inquiry strategies that they then apply in new domains. 
That's work with uh, Janice Gobert of Rutgers. We've also looked at modeling uh, physics understanding in MOOC, uh, sorry, in, uh, in um, action games, where we can tell if students understand Newton's laws, for example, by their gameplay behaviors. Uh, we've worked at automatically detecting affect and engagement. That's been a focus of ours for over a decade now, where we can tell if students, when they're learning from an online learning platform, we've done this for games, simulations, homework platforms, we can tell whether they're bored, frustrated, confused, fairly reliably, just from their interactions with the software. We've used those to model which features of math problem design impact affect and engagement. So we actually took our models of student engagement and emotion and applied it to data from over 100,000 different problems written by teachers in an open learning platform, assessments. And we were able to determine which features of the design of math problems were more and less engaging to students. For example, one of our findings is a lot of teachers create these template problems where it'll say, Bob bought six sweatshirts and Martha bought seven sweatshirts and it cost $52. How much does a sweatshirt cost? And the next problem will be, Bob bought two sweatshirts and Martha bought nine sweatshirts. It cost $66. How much does a sweatshirt cost? And the next problem will be, Bob bought 11 sweatshirts. And those problems are like hydrofluoric acid for student engagement. You pour it on and it just burns a hole right through it. In general, hokey problems which have cover stories that nobody cares about are generally bad for engagement. <coughs> we've done work on large-scale field observation of student engagement. Um, so we've developed protocols for doing field observations on a handheld device of whether students are engaged or not and applied it at scale in several contexts. For example, one study we did over 100,000 um, observations of students in the Pittsburgh area to see uh, what elementary school students, to see what teacher pedagogical strategies were more and less engaging to students. Another example, in the Corporation of Chennai in India, we studied how reform curricula compared to traditional teaching practices had different imp impacts on student engagement. And finally, we've looked at student engagement and behavior in online learning across cultures. So especially as the world globalizes with educational and online learning and blended learning, the question becomes, do students use these technologies in the same way? We've determined that students in Latin America, specifically Mexico, Costa Rica, and Brazil, tend to collaborate in fundamentally different ways during learning than students in North America or the Philippines. Where students in North America, when they're using online learning software in class, blended learning software, tend to work individually. If it's designed for individual work, they'll work individually. Then if they're getting in trouble, they might ask a classmate to help them, or they might talk about an answer. But then they'll go back to working individually. By comparison, in the three Latin American contexts we studied, which differ in a lot of variables, we found that students were more likely to go off together, try to figure out the answer to the problem together, and then go all back and type it in together, each individually. And then if it was wrong, they'd go back and discuss it some more. Students in the Philippines, by contrast, were much less likely to engage in collaborative behaviors than either setting. They were more likely, they were also unlikely to go off task, but they were more likely to try to game the system to get through in a way that that's disengaged but doesn't show, show to the teacher that you're disengaged. This is just kind of, we also looked at how help-seeking behaviors are different in different cultures um, for how students seek help from systems and how that's effective or ineffective for their outcomes. We hope to do some analyses of this going forward with our massive online open course data. Um, Schneider at Cornell has shown that cultural variables like um, the uh, Hofstede dimensions are predictive of how students choose to use MOOCs. We're interested in seeing what other kinds of behaviors may be relevant. So that's it. I'm happy to answer more questions, but before I open the floor for general questions, let me say, if you like what you heard today, all of our papers are available on our low traffic Twitter and Facebook feeds. It's only a few posts a month. We only post big news and papers. We're not going to spam you with our uh, our uh, political observations or things like that. We leave that to other twi twi Twitters. Um, sorry. <laughs> Couldn't resist. George has a great Twitter feed, too. I just don't have the energy and time. I, I assume that George is staying awake all night to be able to do that, and I need eight hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see? There you go. All of our lab publications are available online. Google Ryan Baker. I'm not the Miami Dolphins linebacker. It turns out that other search engines like Bing don't bring me up as prominently, so you've got to use Google for this one. I don't know why. Google likes me, I guess. Um, all publications are available there. We try to be very open about that. 
Um, we have a MOOC, Big Day in Education, which is rebooting in April. We're also part of the UTA MicroMasters in Learning Analytics, uh, so you can kind of get our content either of those ways. Happy to share it. And again, if anyone here wants to use our framework, we are very excited to open it up for other researchers. That's part of our goal. When I got to Penn, the provost said, we're sitting on all this data. It's a gold mine for research, and nobody's using it. If you come here, I want you to make it available to the world. So that's what we're doing. Thank you all for coming today, and uh, I appreciate your comments. <laughs>
the majority probably even, it's probably not even a plurality, it's probably a majority, are what predicts who completes from their behaviors, either in terms of kind of if-then style rules or, in ter or simple statistical analyses or in terms of prediction models. But there has been a lot of other stuff. So for example, <coughs> Schneider at Cornell has looked at how communication patterns correlate to cultural variables. Um, people have looked at the changes in social network dynamics in courses over time. Uh, people have looked at you know, verbal abuse of instructors. That was colleagues of mine. Um, people have looked at lots and lots of things. They've looked at patterns of common errors in responding. They've looked at whether features in the design of videos impact um, student engagement with things like A-B studies. Um, they've looked at supportive messaging. Um, there has been a, a, a too many papers for me to have even pretended to be aware of them all, much less read them, even in just since 2013, 2014. Uh, papers on the demographics of the learners. You know, it turns out that even though MOOCs are used worldwide, it's mostly people who are wealthy and fluent in English. Um, papers on the dissemination and spread, uh, the use of, like, for example, Arabic language MOOCs in refugee camps in Syria and Jordan. So there's been an enormous proliferation of literature on this. Um, technology, the adaptation of that technology in those groups versus uh, countries like the U.S. where uh, learners and students are really familiar with this type of setup. Um. <coughs> so, so the people who take and learn from MOOCs in the developing world, aside from, for example, the work on refugee camps by Jen DeBoer and a couple other groups, largely has been focused on people who are already familiar with the tech modern I in ICT, information communication technology. We've seen more of these kind of issues that you're talking about in K-12 and undergraduate use of educational technologies where there's been efforts to adapt the pedagogy of technologies and the various uh, use of devices to meet the local economic needs and such. I'm thinking, for example, of the work to build um, cell phone-based language instruction in Tanzania via Project Listen and the XPRIZE or the work um, to develop online learning platforms in Brazil for EAD, Educação à Distância, distance education, that can be used uh, with almost no connection on a very old computer. Um, also, those have tr attempted to accommodate the Brazilian preference for collaborative learning. Um, so there's been a decent amount of work, but it's more been in K-12. Um, in fact, America is kind of an outlier in its use of K-12 uh, learning technologies. Um, almost all of the large scale, if I were to be talking in the year 2012, I would be saying that basically all of the large scale use of adaptive learning was all in the United States. As of 2017, it's not 2017 anymore, is it? 2018. As of 2018, it's February now, um, China has really leapt up and has a actually bigger user base in the United States in just those six years. <coughs> um, and Brazil has a large user base in higher ed for Educação à Distância, but still a lot of the blend learning technologies still remain an American phenomenon for the most part. Okay. There are a lot of papers on uh, answering various questions, but those questions <coughs> don't seem like a lot of them really can <coughs> contribute to improving education. And I was just wondering why there aren't more papers along that line. So, and some <coughs> of them, I guess I have another question of um, how, how are you controlling in the, you know, the people who post more are more likely to complete. <coughs> well, if they've dropped out after the first two weeks, they're not gonna be posting anymore. So I assume you're controlling for that some way? So the answer is we're not really controlling for that. Um, and part of the problem is, how do you tell if somebody's dropped out? In a MOOC, people don't usually click the unenroll button. They usually just stop coming. And there are people who will be gone for three weeks, and then they come back. They had something going on in their lives, and they come back. So, I mean, you can do a survival analysis model, like Carolyn Rosé does, where you basically treat the person as having dropped at the time they last participated in any fashion. And you look at how that drops over time, and you look at what predicts that. Uh, that's something that our prediction modeling framework can handle. It's um, actually, I think that the Xing paper 
that we replicated had some survival analysis, survival model style analyses. We're not looking at that explicitly in the uh, production rule because that's actually kind of hard to figure out how to do. Though you're right, it, it interplays. I won't even say it confounds because it interplays with it. As far as the first question goes, boy, that's a rough one. You know, I mean, how much education research does directly contribute back to learning and which pieces of research do? So I would say that at-risk drop prediction models in these kind of things actually do have a goal of directly speaking back to uh, supporting students. If you assume that students who drop and who don't actually want to not, if you take a student, if you assume that students actually want to learn the material, not always the right assumption, and you assume that students want to learn all the material, not just say one lecture, and that's also not a good assumption. If you assume those things, then somebody who drops is a failed opportunity and is a kind of a failure in a sort. If you can do approaches like Justin Reich at MIT has done that actually identify students who look like they're on the path of dropping out and re-engage them and it increases completion rates, I would call that a net positive. Um, I would also say that analyzing the patterns of participation and understanding how those patterns of participation correlate to eventual completion may not seem like it links to student success, but I would actually say that if it helps us understand participation in a deep fashion, maybe we'll be able to better engineer participation in these forums, and maybe eventually we'll be able to say, better yet, better yet, for these kinds of courses, we want to do these kind of measures to improve participation. In these other ones, we want to do these other measures. So I'm, to me, the jury's a little less out on whether this is really just um, intellectual exercises or whether there's real uh, potential contributions. But I think most of you who are doing this kind of work do have a mindset of wanting to make genuine contributions. I know I certainly have that goal. I won't say that every research project I've participated in has made students' lives better. It would be quite far from the truth if I were to claim that. But I'd like to think that in the aggregate across projects, some of them do eventually produce insights, which eventually do end up with better learning technology designs. Thank you.